will ensue when you have a 3 billion pixel camera taking images of the entire sky every three nights with our guests from the LSST Consortium. And I'm going to bring them up in just a minute, but I have to say before I get going, uh, Telescope Talk, both the pro and the amateur versions of these Hangouts, are sponsored by OPT Telescopes in, in California. And if you need professional guidance or have any questions about buying and owning a telescope, I can't recommend these guys enough. So check them out. There's a link in the description box below uh, if you are in, have any kind of issues or questions about purchasing a telescope. Now, we are broadcasting this Hangout on YouTube, both my channel and hopefully... Christian's channel, Launchpad Astronomy. Um, yes, we are. Is it? Oh, good. That's, yes. That's great news. Uh, we're doing this from now on just to kind of build some rapport between our two channels. So you can check out our live streams on both of these simultaneously. Uh, and we're also um, streaming on Facebook on OPT's page. Uh, we're, we're, we're also streaming on Twitch and Periscope, I hope. <laughs> so we <laughs> hope you'll leave us questions and comments on any of these platforms, and I'll read them out at, to our guests as we go along. So, okay, let me bring up my astronomical Brady Bunch. Where is everybody? There he is. Let me start with my co-host right below me is uh, Christian Reddy from Launchpad Astronomy. Hi, Christian. Hey, Tony. How you doing? And uh, yeah, it looks like uh, the technology is finally working for us today. So <laughs> thank you for joining me on my channel, Tony, I guess. Oh, and, you're welcome. Uh, I hope this gets you some you uh, gets you some uh, some subs. If you don't know specifically, <laughs> I put the link into his channel on the description box on my channel. So please, please subscribe, subscribe to him. Sure. Thank you, Tony. Yeah, yeah. you're all you're more than welcome to come over and check me out at Launchpad. But uh, here we are today uh, talking about the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope. And this is something that I'm so excited about because as Tony said, we're talking about a telescope that will look at the entire sky. If it's in the sky above its location in Chile, LSST is gonna see it and watch it and watch it and keep watching it. And that's gonna to lead to some pretty exciting stuff. So why don't we go ahead and introduce our guest, Tony? Okay, great. So um, down right in, in, next to me in our panel here is uh, Dr. Yusra Al-Sayyad. She is a postdoc and she's also working uh, as the technical manager uh, for the data management team on LSST in Princeton. Hi, Yusra. Hi, there you go. You're you're muted still. <laughs> okay. Ah, right. Oh, okay. thanks, Tony, and thanks for having me. Yeah, you're welcome. And right below her is uh, Frosty Economo. She is a t also a technical manager for data management, but she is in Tucson. So welcome, welcome, Frosty. How you doing? I'm doing great. It's good to be here. Oh, I, I can't thank you enough for being here. So let's talk LSST. Where should we start? I already said it's a four, 8.4 meter class instrument. Let me let me put up a quick um, uh, image here. I'm going to put up the image of the site. This one's called, this one has, um, it's the one where of the building site up on the mountain. This is the, where they're building it. Why are you building it up in Chile? In fact, why are we building all these telescopes up in Chile, it seems like? Anybody? Okay, okay I will Yusra, go. Or Frosty, one of the two. <laughs> all right. Uh, I will go and Yusra will correct me. So um, one of the reasons that we build uh, um, telescopes uh, in arid and high mountainous areas is in order to uh, ensure the best weather uh, and to be above as much of the Earth's atmosphere uh, as we actually can. So before a telescope is ever uh, built, uh, there are many years of what we call site surveys where people camp out there with instrumentation and sky monitors uh, and they try to characterize how good a site is going to be. We're spending a lot of money on these telescopes and a lot of effort uh, and every cloudy night that you are close not being able to do astronomy is, uh, is um, time and money down the drain and so we're looking for the best possible weather. And uh, it turns out, actually, that Chile is a pretty science-friendly country, isn't it? This is kind of a a source of economic benefit for these guys. I mean, there's it's not just you guys. There's also CTIO is out there, the Cerro Cerro Tololo International Observatory or Inter Inter something Observatory. Inter Cerro Tololo Inter American Observatory. Inter American. That I knew it was something something weird like that. But they're <laughs> up there. Inter that's that's where the Blanco four meter is. I, I went to that mountain. And then of course Gemini South is there. So there's lots of lots of major observatories are being uh using uh these mountains as a uh, as a site. Okay, let me put up I want to put up just real quick uh so people can see the neck this is the 
one you guys just uploaded. By the way, let me just mention, uh, everybody, that if you – all of these images and the graphs that we're going to be showing you are available on the Google Drive folder. The link to that is in the description box of the YouTube video. Uh, if you go there, you can download all of the stuff uh, and look at it yourself, all the stuff that we're going to be showing you here. They've given us permission to to show that. So let me now put up the um, – the image here this this one's called image 9036-1 guys the one that you uploaded i have to tell everybody this because they need to have it up locally because they can't see what's being broadcast uh this is a scale image of the telescope itself right by scale i mean there's people at the bottom so you can kind of see <laughs> how big this thing is compared to uh, a person Right, and uh, as you can see from the uh, telescope side, uh, the uh, main part of the building is, uh, you know, doing really well. It's uh, almost complete, so we're very excited to finally see a real telescope on the mountain as opposed to the artist's impression of what it's going to look like. <laughs> uh, you will see uh, the dome is uh, still going up, and uh, people will be very happy to see the dome completed. I think uh, they've had two winters with, uh, without a dome uh, where it snows in the building. Uh, mm. And so we're all, uh, all going to be happy when the dome goes in, and then the work of uh, uh, installing the scientific instrumentation can proceed. Okay. And so the dome is that scaffolding part, right? It's not really a Correct. dome. Correct. That's sort of... right. This is it's the structure for yeah. the for the. It's it's a it's for an astronomer it's a dome even though it's not necessarily dome shaped. Yeah, I know we can't get rid of it, can we? I mean, we I, because yeah. it turns out that, you know observatory design has changed over the decades quite a bit actually. The uh, uh, it's it's not so advantageous. I mean, what do you need the curved shape for when you're when you've got these alt azimuth sort of or these actually alt azimuth rotation uh, uh, abilities of of these structures and you can just open a whole doors um, to. Oh, to, to the telescope to see the sky. Okay, and telescopes and, and are just... getting larger. I'm sorry, and telescopes are getting larger and larger. So it, it is driving us to. Uh, new yeah, the domes would have to get larger and larger as well. So, so the idea is that you're. This is more. You can sort of see it in the scaffolding, but this is kind of more like a cylindrical enclosure, less of a dome, but more of a cylinder. So the idea is that. Um, can you tell us like how that works? Are when the telescope moves, I, I take it that the cylinder just moves along right along with it, right? The the dome tracks the telescope, and and mm -hmm. this is all point out that we're software people, so so don't don't ask too many questions as to the nuts and bolts. Uh, <sighs> but yes, okay. there there is uh, there is tracking, and so uh, the the opening of the dome, like in every other telescope, will will move with the telescope. With elasticity, this is particularly challenging uh, because the the telescope is uh, very fast. Uh, as you, as you mentioned, is wide and fast and deep. Uh, and uh, you need to anticipate uh, where the telescope is going to go next um, and so that you can start moving the dome to the next position before you necessarily finish where you currently are without occluding your current observation. And uh, use record tell you a little bit about the scheduler uh, that is being uh, used to uh, plan the observing uh, as uh, she worked with uh, that team as well. Okay, well, I'll do that and I, I want nice. to, but I want to just, let me just show a couple pictures of the telescope and then we're going to move on to uh, the, the software that you guys uh, are working on. So this is the mirror. This is the primary. Now, I wish I had the uh, ray tracing of this because it is a very strange mirror design. And we're going to have another hangout on that, uh, but not we're not going to go into depth with it here today. But it's basically t the primary has two different figures on it. It has a, a one shape that kind of goes in uh, toward the center that Ooh. I don't know what it is off the top of my head, but then it has another uh, figure uh, deeper in the center, which gives it this sort of strange uh, optical ability. And we're going to talk, like I said, we'll talk about that in another hangout, but I wanted to show you the picture. Mm -hmm. This is the primary mirror um, standing up with, with some people. And one more, there's another view here. I'm showing uh, telescope.jpg. And uh, also just for grins, let me uh, also image. This is a truck uh, pulling. What? <laughs> uh, yeah, what is this? Uh, uh, you, sorry, you tell us what you, you gave it to us, I think. So to describe what this is. So our, our various pieces of the telescope are being taken down from where they're being assembled and moved to Chile piece by piece. Um, so this is the coding chamber. It's the bottom half of the coding chamber that has just been shipped. Um, and it had been split in half. And this is a truck taking it through a tunnel up to the, up to the mountain where you can see it just 
barely, barely fits. And yeah. we were talking earlier about how we have a good relationship with Chile. Um, they, they're they very helpful with engineering and logistical challenges like this when they arise. Um, and They really they, are. I mean, I've, I, I've heard that about, you know, they're very enthusiastic about uh the fact that they're that they're that their geography lets this be something that they can offer uh, uh us astronomers and so um it's really a great place to be it's very friendly and, and could i could i uh, just quickly ask uh are you saying that uh this is a picture of the mirror being taken to the mountain the in coding Chile? chamber the coding okay so the mirror is not in there but it's the coding chamber right but right. this is this is actually a rehearsal <laughs> for because the mirror will okay that's what i thought right the actual mirror uh, has not yet okay. been moved to but not yet been moved lssd to. has an a, a coding chamber inside the building um to illuminize the lssd mirror okay uh, so it's so going to be illuminized on the mountain it's going to be illuminized in the mountain and when it needs real illumination there's this uh kind of uh, rube goldberg pulley system that you know brings the mirror down and shifts us along and it goes down an elevator and it falls into the coding chamber uh okay. and it gets real illuminized uh and so that is uh what what uh, that that uh, piece going in but of course it has to be large enough to fit the mirror in uh, so it's giving you a sense of the scale uh, of what it's going to be like so so the, so basically you're you're just are you moving like what is that you're moving like a, like a concrete dummy or just do you, do you have no, an idea but you know chamber. it's not the mirror it, it is the coding chamber it is it is uh, the vessel oh. in which the mirror will go in to get coded i got you okay very good all right yeah. wow. they're gonna yeah that's the chamber that will you be Wow, the illumination barely one, fits. One, one more picture, very pretty one of the uh, installation uh, at sunset. And everybody, okay, this is why. Look at this picture. This is why you build them in the Andes. Where are the clouds <laughs> in this picture, everyone? Can you see? They're out in the distance and below the <laughs> the telescope. Uh, wow. All the water vapor is down below the telescope, <clears throat> which is one of the reasons why people pick these sites. Uh, I want to go to there. It is beautiful. And I'll tell you now, it's the only place I've ever been where mm -hmm. the stars, and I'm not overstating this, cast a shadow. I was lost. I know all my constellations, but I couldn't find any of them that, that night. Wow. Um, okay. And then um, I think we'll stop with the pictures there for just a minute, <laughs> except, except for this one more with the schematic. We won't go into it too much, but you can see it's got uh, uh, the various uh, components to it. Um, it looks like the Hubble uh, from this rendering. Uh, if you show, are you showing the camera, Tony? Yeah, I'm showing the. Am I showing the camera? I am showing the camera. So the uh, the thing I like about that picture is that it has the. Uh, it's, it's a render uh, because they're still working on the camera, but it has the the human for scale, yeah. uh, and uh, this is actually uh, Nadine, who was the project manager for the camera for a long time, and she's my height, so now. When we show this picture, I can pretend it's a it's a rendering of me, but it's not really. Uh, but that, <laughs> that, that actually shows you the scale of the aperture of our three gigapixel camera. Right? It's a very large piece of kit. Where it says focal plane and that light, you see those little squares. Those are all CCDs, folks. That's where the camera will be imaging from, and that is huge. It's like the size of a well, half the size of a person, just a focal plane. So that is the camera that's going to be used on and the, and. and Really quick, just for all of our photography fans, why don't you remind us again, Ursula or Frosty, how many pixels are we talking about in that camera? It is 3.2 gigapixels. So if you wow. were to put that image into 4K TVs, you would need two 4K TVs for each CCD. And then there's 200, roughly 200 CCDs on the focal plane and you would require about half of a basketball court to project to wow. show your <laughs> the three uh, three point two gigapixels. The, the the full native resolution. You need a basketball court of four hundred four K TVs. That's right. Right? Am I counting that right? Yeah. Whoa, that's that's a lot of data. Um, is that a problem? <laughs> I mean, to have that much data. I mean, how much? How much? Well, first of all you know, you're going to be taking picture after picture after picture of the sky. I mean, maybe you could tell us a little about how the telescope will operate. And then I'd like to then talk about what do you do with all that data? So can you first describe how the telescope will operate on a, on any given night? Sure. Um, and the, the data challenge was one of the main reasons why I wanted to join this project. It's, it's part of the fun. Um, so the, the telescopes, the survey strategy is going to be fully automated 
we are going to collect uh, science cases and goals from the community. And these are gonna go into a cost function, which we'll be able to optimize. And then in real time, based on this cost function and the weather and the clouds and the conditions where the moon is, it will automatically uh, take picture after picture every 30 seconds. It'll take uh, a image that is about 40 times the size of a full moon and then move on to the next one 30 seconds later, and then move on to the next one 30 seconds later. And in this way, it'll be able to image the whole sky in, or the full Southern sky in 30, uh, in just three days. Wow, the entire sky in three days. And okay, so we, yeah, I guess we should probably talk a little bit about the, um, uh, the way in which it's scanning. Now you have this uh, movie, I'm gonna put it up real quick. This one is, uh, a sort of a GIF. You had it as a GIF image. I've turned it into a uh, uh, a movie that shows how the camera will scan an area. It looks like you've got a portion of M31 there, the Andromeda Galaxy, right? Yes. Yeah. And this was a graphic put together by uh, Slack, the the Stanford Accelerator Accelerator Lab, which is currently the team that's working on the, the camera okay so it looks like it's uh this is showing the different filters and then it uh the way it the way it is um switching between the different wavelengths and then it's the is this field of view do you know if this field of view is more or less accurate as far as how much of m31 it'll cover um i believe it is okay. so the the now remember the focal the the array of ccds is about two feet by two feet two feet so it's it's this this big and so the filters themselves have to be this big and it's that's right it's important it to remember engineering... remember see though you, if you look at the left side of this image you could see the little squares those are the ccds and we saw how big that was in the other one that was let me put that image up real quick we saw that that was huge you could see that that's about half the size of a person and so these filter wheels as they're coming through are um are big they're really big in, in diameter and they're clunking mm -hmm. into place i won't I don't use that word like you know, it's a it's clunky. It's just that they 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 are, it's going to have to. It's a significant amount of weight that you're moving in uh, for all of this. So, what are the typical observing exposure times? Do you do you know for the uh, for this when it's doing when it's in survey mode and looking at the entire sky? What are the exposure lengths that you're going to be taking? So currently, the baseline is to have thirty second exposure times and have that be the same regardless of what the weather is on that particular night. Um, at one point in history, we thought it would be necessary to take two 15 second exposures and then add them together. But it, after some discussions recently, it seems as though that isn't actually necessary to achieve our science goals. Hmm. Good. Okay, so you can just do one continuous 30 second mm -hmm. and just move on. Great. That's right. That reduces the overhead time, right? Because you're not spending as much time recycling the camera for another 30, another 15 second exposure. That's right. And when you, when you have 30 second exposures and then you're working in survey mode like this, every second counts towards mm -hmm. your science impact. Every second you can shave off between for readout time, slew time, filter change time that adds up to more exposures, more science. Okay, well, wow. that's, a, that's a good segue into what I want to ask you about now. So you've seen the telescope. You, we've seen the place where they're building at. We get an idea of just how large it is. Uh, what are some of the things? Just give us a broad, a broad overview. Um, uh, just to give us a big picture view. What are some of the things LSST is going to be able to give us? And why do we need a survey telescope like this to do it? So the, right. <laughs> the special thing about LSST is that is that it is a full time domain survey. It'll create a movie of the sky that lasts for 10 years hmm. of the whole sky. And we really haven't had, we've had very specialized time domain surveys so far, but we haven't really had a complete sky time domain survey. And so this is really gonna open up time domain astronomy. So anything that, anything that changes, any standard candles that require 
uh, that require um, have special variability sign signatures to find. This, these include type 1a supernova, RR Lyrae stars. Uh, we're going to find orders of magnitudes more of these types of objects, and this is going to impact dark energy, our dark matter, our history of how the Milky Way was formed. Um, another type of objects that change are uh, asteroids, which are moving across the sky, and you need multiple exposures in order to be able to detect these. We're going to have uh, an unprecedented amount of data uh, of asteroids that we can use to constrain the history of the solar system. So if you think about just what she just said, it's, it, I mean, a 10 year time lapse of the entire sky, at least as it can be seen from Chile, uh, that will be from 30 second frames, essentially, uh, that all of the, imagine the kind of science you can do from something like that. You, it, it, it just, I just, that's quite remarkable, but, and yeah. now we're going to get to the part that you guys are specialists in, which is data management. This is something that's been called big data. We've heard the term. It's it's a sort of catch-all phrase for everything from medical imaging to astronomical imaging. But it's basically this ability to handle large amounts of data and do things with it. So three plus billion pixels times what's the bit depth of the pixel? A couple of uh, is is are they floats or are they? In, big ints do you know how many because you have to multiply three billion by the depth of each pixel that tells you how many bytes one frame how many bits one frame will take uh what's the image size of one 10 a uh, 30 second exposure do you guys know it's about 8.2 gigabytes per exposure <laughs> and you're <Wow>. taking <laughs> eight gigabytes for one 30 second exposure and that's the raw data Right. So that's just when you take yeah. an image, you come down. You've also, uh, presumably, you still have to take calibration images, right? Uh, not, let me get to that in a minute. <laughs> eight, eight gigabytes of data per frame. And how many frames per night? Uh, about 2. Oh, Yusra, do you remember? Uh, I believe it's about uh, 2,000 if you include all the calibrations. Yeah, about a hundred an hour. Okay, so doing the math in my head, and it's eighteen bits per pixel since you asked. Eighteen bits per pixel. Depth, and don't, bit? I, don't ask me why. <laughs> okay, so doing <laughs> the math weird, in my head, it? that's a, that's a ridiculous amount of data. So that's uh, every night. That is, yeah, that is a rem uh, remarkable uh, amount of data over the lifetime of this survey. It's uh, half an exabyte, in fact. Half an exabyte over the lifetime of the survey. Oh my goodness! Wow. Wait a minute. So what's a, hold on. What's an exabyte? exabyte scale. It's the thing up, up after petabyte. It's after petabyte. Okay. You know what? When you hear say exabyte, you know what that reminds me of? Those old DLT drives. There's little you... tapes. I, yeah. know. <laughs> I, I, I actually, that's why. No, that's we're talking why about the real like thing, it, real yeah. exabyte. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh, you put it in the exabyte drive, and all it really was was these old cheesy videotape um, tape readers but uh yeah, okay. i know get, a lot of our viewers three seconds are... worth of data yeah <laughs> I, I i know i know a lot of our viewers um you know they they they're they're into tech uh in fact some of them are are youtubers themselves who review technology and cameras and things like that i wonder if this would be a a, a camera that they might enjoy having uh for christmas uh i'm not sure if a dex uh ships that size <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so uh, with with respect to um, okay, so hang on just a second. Let me get to um, one of okay. So Galaxy is asking, can you please elaborate a bit about its capabilities and instrument specs and goals concerning exoplanets and exo life atmospheres? Um, I, I can help with this, and I'll, I know that you guys are primarily in data management. Uh, well, first of all, do you know the answer to that question? Is that something you can address? As far as how will LSST will it will it do anything with respect to exoplanets? Like, can uh, will a thirty second exposure over a certain period of time allow you to see light curves uh, in 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 variable stars? If you, I mean, if you can see these changes in brightness of a variable star, can you see a dip in brightness due to an exoplanet? Yes. So, I, so my specialty is not um, right. I know that's why. I know this is a little <laughs> bit out of your realm. So, do you but yes, any time domain survey, you'll be able to see uh, ecl exoplanets eclipsing their their host stars. 
as as far as exolife uh, atmospheres goes, there's no spectroscopy on this telescope, but we'll at least be able to find targets for the for the future. Right, and that's important because you need in order to galaxy in order to see an ex uh, an exo planet's atmosphere uh you, it's funny because astronomers make a lot of assumptions like if you've got a super earth they kind of assume because it's rocky and it's of a certain mass that it has an atmosphere i learned that we learned that in a couple of hangouts ago where they really the reason they talk about atmospheres is because the way planets form if they have a certain mass and if they're above a, you know a certain mass not necessarily even rocky then they will probably have an atmosphere uh that just comes with the way planets are formed and so the, if if you're seeing a uh a transit go through and you're looking at the life curve that's one thing and that's what lsst apparently will be able to have the resolution to see but it won't have any spectroscopic ability so that's the kind of thing i'm you know I go back to ls or to jwst it's going to need to help us with because you look at it will have near spec uh, uh, on board a near infrared spectrometer that will be able to measure the components of what's in any atmosphere that might be present. I, and in fact, uh, you're correct. And uh, I, I shall just say very quickly that if you Google LSST science book, uh, you will find uh, a, a, a compendium of all the kind of uh, science cases that are behind LSST, and it's really quite impressive how it addresses astronomy on every physical scale. So if you want to know what LSST will do in your favorite area of astronomy, LSST science book uh, is where you want uh, to go. If you have insomnia, that might also help you. Um, uh, so, but You're I'll, saying I'll it's not say exciting. Yes. Uh, it, can, it can get a bit heavy at times. I'm just, gonna, I'm, I'm just warning you now. Um, so uh we're not but, uh, talking about a pamphlet we're talking yeah <laughs> we are we are we're talking about something heavy enough to be a self-defense weapon um so <laughs> uh but going back to the issue of uh spectroscopic follow-up so lssd uh is absolutely uh designed with the assumption that the lssd finds things uh and other facilities that are have the appropriate instrumentation for following up on it uh, will then uh, follow up uh, with further observations. And uh, this is why uh, our um, data management system includes an alert system where uh, when the uh, science pipelines uh, detects that something has changed, it will send out a message uh, on the internet that other telescopes can subscribe to uh, and decide whether they want to follow up on something particularly interesting. And, and user is definitely the person to talk a little bit more about how the uh, the, uh, the alert uh, generation and follow-ups uh, work. Okay. Uh, I'll, I will segue you into that, Yusra, by just reading Better and Better's comment he, on YouTube. He's going, but does it only record changes like a security camera? Well, it records everything, <laughs> and then you can see changes within the different frames. But, yeah, do you want to talk about that a little bit, uh, the, the transients and, and the changes in, in what it will see? Sure. Um so, uh, so it is, it is not like a security camera. We are going to store all the data. Um, <laughs> not just the changes. It, yeah, and because this isn't a space-based telescope, we don't have to worry about um, data transfer rates or, I mean, we do have to worry about that, but we're not limited in the same way that space telescopes are limited. Okay. So, we have two modes of processing. Um, and so I, the team that I work on is the team that does the science pipelines. And that's, we write the software that converts the pixel data into a database of stars and galaxies. And for each one, it's measurements like shape, brightness, color, size, and all of its characteristics. Um, so we think a lot about how to combine this multi-epoch imaging to extract the most amount of data from it. And we'll be doing this in two, two different modes. So one mode is difference imaging, um, and that's to find what has changed in real time. We will build up stacks of all the previous images. This will be a template of the static sky. And for every new exposure that comes off the telescope, we're going to subtract this template from the new exposure and this will yield a map of what has changed. And I, uh, 
I included in the Google Drive an example of what this difference imaging. I'm, I'm showing it now as you like. talk, so maybe you can explain it at the three frames. Okay, so the the first two frames the, on the left on the middle are two different visits of the same part of the sky. And these images were not taken with LSST because it doesn't exist yet, but they were taken with DCAM also in Chile. Uh, and that's... Um, Right. Okay. So then the, the picture on the right hand side is the, the first two pictures subtracted from each other. And you can see that the, the background of stars and galaxies disappear. And all that's left is what has changed, which you wouldn't have necessarily seen if you were just looking for these two, the first two images and then matching all the positions on them. So this, the object that has changed is most likely an asteroid in this image. So there's the two frames, the left one, the middle one, the the middle or one of the one is subtracted from the other, and then the far right is the difference, the result of that subtraction. There is a black blob off to the sort of the leftish part of that, and then there are other white lighter blobs that are kind of black and white, right? I mean, they have components of a little bit of light and dark. Where's right. the asteroid? And, oh, the asteroid is the dark is the dark spot. So in this example, the oh. second image has been subtracted from the first and the, the asteroid was in the second image. So it appears as a negative image here. The, the white and dark blobs, we call those dipoles. And those are the bane of all difference imagers ex existences. Um, these are, so for, if you have a bright star, for any, ast for any astrometric offset of those two stars, there's a brightness for which you'll get a dipole. It's just uh, just an unfortunate hmm. thing we have to deal with. So the white specks uh, in that third frame, those are the dipoles, which are imaging artifacts. They're not real, right? They are, so by dipole, I mean any point where you see a, a black and a white dot right next to each other. That means that mm -hmm. So in this case, I, I don't want to get into the details too much. It was, it could be either caused by astrometric, uh, a bad astrometric solution, or in this case, uh, differential chromatic refraction in which stars of different colors actually move a little bit on the focal plane because of the the atmosphere that they're passing through shifts them up or down a little bit depending on how much air mass they're passing through yeah and chances are you would not see these as much in a hubble difference image uh simply because that you would see that maybe the the, ch the changes in in the wavelengths if they had different wavelengths in them but because the this there's atmosphere involved here you can't remove that entirely and you get these little these little dipoles so there's so you have one image minus another image equals what's left over and that the, it just shows up as bright or dark spots, depending on which image was subtracted. And this is how you find things that change in the sky. Uh, there was something in one image that was not in another. And this is the easiest way to see it. But because of the sheer amount of data that are coming out of this telescope, and in fact, out of a lot of different telescopes, you can't do this by with a person looking at all of this, right? How... so. You have all of these 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 terabytes of data coming down every single night. Um, what do you do? You process it. On, let me back up. Let's start with the with the with the data flow, and then we'll talk about how you find objects because I think that's done uh, automatically. You said you 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 look at these things and you split it up into stars and galaxies and all this kind of stuff. But let's talk about the data flow first. It comes off the camera. What happens? Where does it go then? It comes off the camera. We calibrate it. We There, on the camera. By calibrating, you mean you do flat fields and dark subtractions, things like that? That's right. Okay. Right after, right after we take the exposure. Uh, we run detection, do measurement, do this difference imaging procedure, run detection and measurement on the difference images. This gets converted into a table of alerts. And these alerts are going to be distributed to the science community in real time so that if there is supernova candidates or interesting features that need immediate spectroscopic follow-up, the community has this information available and can go follow up as soon as possible. 
and okay, and then uh, the alert system. Can can anybody join that? By the way, <laughs> or is it only open to other scientists? Yeah, it's it's totally public, and everybody can can subscribe to our alert stream. Now okay. it's I, I forget the exact numbers, but it is an ex- <laughs> it is a fire hose. <laughs> Be careful what you ask for, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm well, sure. And you- it's- Oh, and no different yeah, images are clean. alerts, right? So there's going to be a lot of false positives as well. Right. Uh, have you guys run, simu- we did this in the dark energy survey. Did you guys run uh, simulations, run, uh, do dry runs of, of data, um, of data flow and then alert systems and things like that? Did you, have you guys done that? Were we you- have not done that yet, but there are other time domain telescopes like the ZTF that are getting a head start on that. Um, and, trying that out now okay all right well uh so frosty what can you add to this what after the alert system can you tell us what happens to the the data once it's taken and the alerts have been uh uh sent out the calibrations is that a final calibration by the way the one that's done on the fly no uh, sorry (laughs) oh go ahead um it's not a final calibration and like why we started saying earlier there's two modes of processing there's this this uh instant prompt on the telescope immediate processing and then there's there's also going to be an annual data release production where we're going to recalibrate all the images do the stacking produce the templates for the difference imaging procedure and do the the types of processing that you need for static sky science weak lensing any kind of statistical studies of variability any types of studies where you need the, the best calibrated data possible okay and uh, so, Frosty, can you can you add some more about what happens after all of that? So yeah, let me let me tell you what happens. So uh, just if you were just caring about the the the, the practical data flow, because I think you asked about that. Uh, the data actually gets siphoned off the summit uh, through our very fast network uh, and uh, arrives uh, at our uh, LST data facility, which is uh, located at the. National Center for Supercomputing Applications, NCSA, mm-hmm. uh, at Illinois, uh, where uh, the software uh, produced uh, by the user's team will run on it in order to um, uh, process the data. Um, so as Yusra said, there, there are two kinds of data processing. There's the, uh, let's find the things that have changed tonight, right now, right this instant. Uh, and there's a very tight time budget for doing that. We are aiming to actually get alerts uh, within 60 seconds of the shutter closing, which if you actually think about all that is involved to do that is, uh, is a, a very high bar. Um, and then there is the uh, kind of more thorough, deep processing that has to go uh, in order to get the sensitivity uh, of the kind of um, uh, the required from the kind of cosmological uh, science areas. And that's part of the annual data release production that that user referred to. Um, so I can talk a little bit about what happens now. So uh, big data in astronomy is actually quite a new thing. Um, of course, you guys talk to the SKA folks and other, other projects that are coming online with very, you know, big data volumes. SK uh, is a actually, square kilometer ray, just uh, one more th- uh, th- That's right. Uh, we're, we're terrible with our <laughs> in, uh, in astronomy. Um, and so uh, this actually is a big change in the way that astronomers interact with data. Now, as you know, uh, the kind of traditional workflow uh, has always involved, like you go to a telescope, you take your data, you put it on your old fashioned exabyte tape. Um, uh, and, you know, you take it home and, you know, you put it on your machine or your laptop and you kind of uh, play with it um, and you kind of try to understand uh, what you're seeing. Uh, and um, and then uh, there's, a, there's a highly iterative process when an astronomer looks at data. They kind of look here, they'll kind of look there, they try this algorithm, they try this other algorithm. And then finally they're satisfied and kind of say, okay, now I'm going to apply this algorithm to all the data. So, so that's the kind of way that uh, astronomical discovery uh, is made. Um, now, in the big data era, uh, the data cannot come to you. That's just too much of it. Uh, even the catalogs, just the database uh, that uh, is involved is petabytes in size. There are uh, 7 trillion rows in the data database uh, of, of, of object measurements. Um, and so uh, if the data cannot come to the astronomer, the astronomer has to come to the data. Um, and this is a kind of emerging paradigm in astronomy, which is 
uh, instead of you taking the data and then running uh, your code to it, uh, your code has to go to where the data is. Um, and uh, instead, we need a facility for people to interact with the data the way they used to interact with on their local machines, but at the data center, so that they, we don't have to pay the penalty of the network transfer and storage uh, at the astronomer's end. And so what are we doing uh, for that is we're developing a science platform, which is a web-based environment to allow us astronomers to interact with the data uh, with the same kind of level of uh, power and insight that they did when they were uh, noodling around in their own machines, but this time with where the data is. And uh, if you like, I can show some of it to you. Okay, yeah, that'd be great. Uh, and I want to point out something that I think is understated in what she, in what Frosty just said. The ability of getting these images and then automatically sorting them into these trillions of rows of objects whether some they're going to know r right away they're going to run software on all of these images and say this is a star this is a galaxy this is a couple of galaxies blended together and then they have to de-blend them and set them apart all of this work is happening on the fly and this the, the days are gone of you going to a telescope saying, I would like a night on the this telescope and I want to take all of these images of the Andromeda galaxy. And then you go home with your little uh, CD-ROM or, 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 or DVD or whatever it is of your data. Those days are gone because the, the, the amount of data that you get now, there's just nothing realistically able to just deal with that other than these kinds of data management systems. And one of the things I love about doing these Hangouts is I have a team of people watching them who love to do the math. And so Peter Q on Discord has just said, one exabyte is one quintillion bytes. So he did the math. He figured it out for us. So that's what an exabyte is. Well, thank you, Peter Q. I appreciate that. Okay, so you want to show us something. You want to... Yeah. You I, I just want to say quintillion sounds like one of those like gazillion type made of words. <laughs> well, like, you know, or a cotillion. That's something you used to go well, back yeah. in Victoria days. It stops mattering at that point. <laughs> I, I, think, I think Peter Quinn wanted to point out the quintillion for a reason. Oh, that's I didn't catch that. Ah. <laughs> A little self-serving there. Okay. There you go, Peter. Okay. I'll just shout out to you. All right. Uh, yeah. All right. We're going to try an experiment. She's going to share her screen. And I don't know how this is going to project. So I'll play with it. Be patient. Go ahead and show your screen, uh, Frosty, and we'll see how this goes. Uh, I'm doing this now, and uh, I'm going to try to keep this down in uh, two five minutes, uh, which uh, can you see my screen? Can you see my? I, um, I think so. I'm going to make I, it a little bit bigger. But yeah, go ahead and show us what you're what you're what. First of all, describe what we're looking at. Actually, is, you know what? I'm not sharing my whole screen. If if I just want to share my window, so that will actually uh, make it bigger for you on your end. Let me just try that. Uh, let's see. There uh, we go. This, <laughs> this should be better. Come on. If All we right. knew what we were doing, it wouldn't be called research. Don't that's we right. Do that's right. <laughs> on the edge All right. Take screen. risks here. Uh, on. Okay. All right. So I'm seeing uh, something called a. Firefly visualization demo. Right, yep. right, right. And and so uh, I just want to say that uh, so LSSD, uh, we're very proud that it's a it's a big open source development shop. Uh, all the software that teams like mine and users are doing um, are uh, is being released. Uh, it's actually on GitHub. Uh, you can find it, you can see it, you can play with it, uh, and we're very, very proud of that. And we have valuable collaborations with um, a lot of uh, other open source projects. And uh, one of them uh, is this fabulous project called Jupiter Lab. Um, and some of you may be familiar with Jupyter Notebooks, and Jupyter Lab is the next generation infrastructure that's still in beta, but it's uh, extremely uh, successful and promising, and we have adopted it in a very big way. Um, so Jupyter Lab is uh, an environment that is allows you to uh, write uh, py typically Python. It's not just Python, but for astronomers, uh, it, it it generally is uh, Python notebooks. Uh, from uh, your browser, uh, the, the notebooks execute on the server end, and so they're running at the data facility uh, where the data actually is. Um, and this allows you to, uh, it's, it's a mechanism for actually bringing your computer to the data if you want to interactively uh, play with it, uh, as opposed to the kind of uh, batch factory processing 
that Yusra was talking about uh, uh, for the science pipelines. And uh, what I wanted to say was that, like you say, this is a new kind of new era, you know, where, where we are in the kind of big data mode, but we're trying to give people the flexibility that they had uh, in the kind of traditional era and not kind of take that away from them. So one of the things I love about the Jupyter Lab environment uh, is that, um, uh, it actually, this is all running in my browser. There's, 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 there's no tricks. I, it'll run Chrome, Safari, whatever you want. Uh, is that it comes with a built-in terminal emulator. So mm. although uh, although I am running my browser, I, uh, I can actually just uh, you know interact with the environment in which my notebooks are running uh, just uh, from a regular Unix command. So line. hang on, you just opened up a terminal window in the browser to interact yeah. with your. I know, right? Uh, Isn't it great? I know, <laughs> I, and 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 I'm I'm doing a double take here because I I'm, I at first I'm thinking this is, this is not all happening in the browser. You're 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 sending this through HTTP back to the back to the the server. That that is correct, and uh, wow. I have to say the first the, the first time I saw this, uh, it blew my mind. Uh, yeah, we have, now we mine's have, we have uh, come a long way, um, and so wow. uh, I just want to say that we have a uh, just. I'm just going to go geek on you for two minutes. Please bear with me. Yep. Um, we have uh, we are our system that we have built on top of Jupyter Lab uh, can be deployed at the Elasticity Data Facility and is, uh, but. Uh, in this particular case, is uh, I have a deployment on the Google Cloud platform. So if you have a credit card and you go to your GitHub page and you get the system, you too will be able to to, to have this uh, for it. But remember to run everything down before it costs you a lot of money. Um, so uh, this is it. And and now now I want to show you uh, something else. Uh, and then I realize we're going to run out of time. So I'm yeah, I want to get to some questions. So. Uh, that was the terminal me, emulator. Yeah, and uh, now I just want to show you uh, our display here. Firefly is the uh, imaging product by uh, the data management team based in IPAC uh, in Pasadena. And what you see is here uh, a kind of imaging uh, interface. Uh, and then I'm going to... Uh, Put this on the side, which I can actually do in this environment. And um, let's see. Now, ultimately, uh, this, this is, is how people will interact with the LSST data. That's right. You're yeah. getting a very sneak preview of uh, how it's all how it's all going to work. <laughs> and uh, if I'm just going to make this run the nest of the notebook really quickly. Um, so down below is the notebook, right? Right, so you see the notebook above, you see this, the Python code, and now we have, uh, this is again, all in browser. Yep. Uh, you can now see, and what I'm, I guess I'm gonna blow your mind some more, uh, you can move these widgets around in, uh, inside your browser uh, in order to uh, get it kind of how, how you like Holy it. Holy moly. And last wow. one, so you can get to your questions. Uh, let's see, I'm gonna put that there. Uh, and uh, there is full brushing and linking between these three displays, and so I'm going to prove this to you right, by just on. clicking clicking on a point here, and you will see uh, the row in the table that represents that point is highlighted, uh, oh, and, and the little and the little point on the graph gets highlighted, and oh. you can select points in the graph, and it will select them uh, on your table and your image and so on. So this is this is like us using technology that we. Uh, we are leveraging that exists out there in order to give uh, people remotely the kind of experience uh, that they had working with the data locally on their own laptops. So I, I guess, first of all, hats off. Wow. I mean, that is that is truly remarkable. Um, I'm, and I know Tony and I were probably dating ourselves here, but my, you know, back in our day. Um, quick question for you, though. So this is all going to be accessible. Uh, where will this be found? Is and is this something that even the public could log into and play around with? So our education and public outreach team is working on ways to give uh, public access 
um, to to the system. Uh, uh, strictly speaking, this um, this uh, system is for LSSC data rights holders, uh, which of course in, you know includes all U.S. astronomers, and I believe there there are discussions as to how to bring that to the amateur astronomical community. But that goes into kind of policy level, so don't get me don't get me in trouble. Um, and so. Uh, we are very, very excited that this uh, truly gives people, and you can imagine a classroom, you don't have to install any software, you don't have to do anything. Uh, this, this, uh, this notebook runs the uh, software developed by uh, Usera's uh, Science Pipelines team, um, and you didn't have to install, you didn't have to get it, you didn't have to build it, you don't have yeah. to understand how it works, you just open your notebook and there it is for you to use. Uh, so we're we're very excited about this. So this is why it's being housed all the data at the NCSA in uh, in the the supercomputing application center because all of this data is using supercomputers and super uh, storage units uh, to to house and to serve all of this stuff. And um, so that's that's why it's 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 actually going there. So that that's amazing. That was a really good interface. And so this is what you do with large data sets. You don't have it sitting on your desk anymore. Everything is, I guess you can call it a cloud, but it's, you really need a good effective way to ask science questions of this data uh, without ever downloading it, all of it yourself, only what you need. And then you, that also allows you to, one of the things I like about it is when you're writing a paper, you're all using the same software. So when you make a discovery, and you find something out using this data, you can publish what you did in this system, in the paper, and other people can then go back and do it. I can't tell you how many times, folks, a guy will publish a paper with software that they wrote in Fortran in 1963, <laughs> and nobody else can, can even compile it to, and so to right. reproduce their efforts. This is huge. This is a big uh, so deal. so that's right. And and can I say that although this uh, this kind of uh, interactive Python environment, it's it's absolutely not a replacement for the kind of algorithmic uh, software environment that user team is developing. I mean, you still need to actually have hardcore algorithmic processing pipelines to churn through the data. But what it, is it does, what it can help you capture is, you know, if, I, if anybody has been experienced of being a grad student in astronomy, you know, and you kind of watching over your supervisor's shoulder and he does some magic that he goes, oh, all you have to do is this. And he types like some incomprehensible idea or God knows what in his command line. And then he goes, see now you should understand and you're going what just happened <laughs> um, and, uh, and and so what what this does is it gives you the ability to capture in a very reproducible like you say way and, and in a very nicely presented way the kind of interactive investigations that previously were just essentially uh, oral history uh, passed down from astronomer to astronomer and from uh, supervisor to student. Right. And now we can capture them and, and share them with everybody and, and show our techniques at a very detailed, practical level as opposed to just the uh, theory of it. And I can and, also and, hear, okay, go ahead, Chris. Go ahead, Christian. I was just going to ask, and, and uh, I'm being asked uh, in, in our chats, um, so where will the data hub be geographically located? Is all this going to be on the mountain in Chile or is it going to be? NCSA, uh, right? So, so there, there are a number of uh, data access centers. Uh, so the U.S. data access center will be an NCSA in Illinois. There will be a data access center in Chile for Chilean astronomers. Uh, there are also uh, planned data centers in uh, France uh, uh, for uh, that they will probably serve uh, European uh, Union users. Uh, there is one being developed, I believe, uh, in Britain. And so uh, one of the reasons that we are very um, keen on this kind of uh, general purpose uh, technology advancements like Jupiter Lab is that now as a data access center, you don't just need our data, you can actually take our software as well and provide the same kinds of services to your users uh, that they would get uh, if they were uh, US astronomers in the US. So this is, this is gonna be a big change for, uh, wow. for uh, the, the facilities that people can, can use when they're exploiting LSST data. It's huge. Amazing. It's, a, it's a parad definitely a paradigm shift. So uh, Hans Milling commented, never thought I would see a Linux shell 
in Tony's videos. What's that supposed to mean, Hans? I love Linux. I run Linux all the time. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, you're going to see them, and you'll see more. Now that you said that, I'm going to show you more Linux shells. Uh, Camp Dijon wants to know how much processing is done, how big is the data center? Um, that's sort of a vague question, but you have to. You want to maybe describe, give us a sense of just how much uh, computing power is being thrown at this data? Um, sure. I believe the uh, peak compute power, I'm just looking on my cheat sheet uh, because I can't remember my own phone number. Uh, <laughs> the uh, peak compute power uh, at the data center is uh, sized to be one, 1. 1.8 petaflops. <laughs> Sorry. It's a... Um, <laughs> It's. I mean, we feel like we're living in the future in this project. It's oh, uh, really, pretty, yeah. pretty, pretty amazing. Uh, the peak number of nodes in, is one thousand seven hundred and fifty. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, are you guys using, by any chance, any um, GPUs for this processing, or is it all just regular CPUs? Graphic, you know, like uh, video we're, cards. We're planning like... on using just regular CPUs. Okay, I'm just curious about that. Uh, yeah, in general, uh, I I personally have found that the uh, going down to specialized architecture never really pays off. True, uh, that is true. I mean, when you use those NVIDIA cards, you uh, end up with very specialized. I mean, software. I mean, theor theoretical, theoretical kind of physical simulations are kind of a, a, a special case, but in this particular case, I think having software that can run on a generic architecture is an advantage to everybody. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So Neil Yu was commenting about, will NASA use this to hide asteroids or whatever, may, may, or UFOs? Uh, first of all, you should know that NASA has nothing to do with this. <laughs> this is actually not a government project, is it? I mean, I, I think NSF might be involved, but this is a corporation. This is not a government funded thing is it oh, oh okay okay uh okay this is this is getting complicated so this the the lsst is actually funded by the national science oh, Foundation. It is. okay your taxpayer dollars we thank you uh and the department uh of energy uh which has supported the camera building uh, at slack uh however it is operated on behalf we're not directly owned by the government uh, the lsst is operated uh, by the Association for University Research in Astronomy, which is a non-profit organization, uh, and it's operated on behalf of the National Science Foundation. Uh, I can tell you, I have not seen any men in black coats uh, around yet. Um, and uh, certainly, if there's any nefarious plan to uh, hide the data, I, I am personally not aware of it. Yes, yeah, so there's a there's a, a big lot concern. of well, you know, data. Because NASA does hide. hide things, and it hides. It hit it hit the bureau from us for well it's still hiding yeah things. but uh, uh, but but yes it's uh no it, it the nasa is not really involved although the national science foundation is and um this data folks you can go get it i mean frosty just showed you how to interact with it you're gonna have to keep track of your costs because it's expensive but you can get access to this eventually they're you're working that out right and that what i heard you say guys you guys are still how can amateurs get it you, that also is still being worked out but this is not just a trivial thing you don't just put a bunch of images on an archive and say yeah go ahead and have at it right so so uh data rights is a kind of a specialized uh, area but the the one things i can tell you that i am fairly certain i am correct on is that the alerts uh, as user said are public um, so the alerts of, of, of object changing in the sky will be available to anybody. Uh, the data itself uh, is going to be constrained to countries that have data rights, uh, of, of which the U.S. is one, the U.K. is one, France is one, Chile is one. Um, and so if, you, if you're watching this and you're not in one of those countries, lobby your representatives uh, to get uh, LSST data access for, behalf, for your scientists uh, and your community. Um, and uh, we are planning citizen science projects uh, through Zooniverse. Uh, we are planning uh, uh, public outreach to, to kind of school populations uh, and also to, um, um, to provide certainly parts of this data for uh, the general public to understand more of what it is that we do. Okay. And we didn't actually talk about this, so we need to mention it before we go. And then we got to go because we're already past time. What is the... Um projected first light when are we going to be starting when are we going to turn this thing on ah so in your uh, google drive there you have a uh timeline uh sketch uh and of course you know uh it's uh projects are what they are but uh right now as you can see the full science operations uh is scheduled to uh 
beginning late 2022, uh, System First Light is in uh, a kind of early to mid 2021. Okay. Uh, and that is that is what we uh, where we're currently working towards. So it's starting it's starting to not feel so far away right now. Are you guys getting stressed out? <laughs> no, I'm getting excited. This is going to be awesome. <laughs> oh, that is great. Well, I, okay. So a couple years away, we're we're going to be uh, looking at some first light images from these from the Large Synoptic Sky Survey or La Large Synoptic survey telescope i would want to put sky in there for some reason it should be the lsssst uh and so i want to thank you all th thank you guys for taking time out to talk yeah, thank with you us so much this. and uh we will uh keep you guys posted on future developments we're going to try to get some uh more members of the lsst team as the as the as the project progresses and hopefully we'll learn uh uh we'll get We'll get some more news as to whether the uh, the the schedule is still on track or not. So, uh, um, so my guest today, let me just reintroduce them. It was Doc, it was Dr. Yusra Al Syed. She's the uh, postdoc working, or and she's working on the science. She's a technical manager of the Princeton data management team. Also, Frosty Economo. She's the technical manager of the Tucson data management team, and that should tell you something. If there's data management teams all over the place, there's a lot of data to deal with. So, uh, I want to thank you guys so much for taking time out to talk with us about your project and we hope you'll come back and tell us more uh yeah. as time gets closer will you do that for us i'm putting you I always i'm cool. putting the guests on the spot they're like what am i supposed to say no <laughs> absolutely no <laughs> yeah as as you as you can tell from the fact that we run over we really like talking about this Good. stuff well thank That's you so great. much and thank, you, thank, you, so much yeah, thank you so much for joining us oh, and i uh, just want to say thank you tony for uh streaming this on my channel and thank you all uh watching on launchpad astronomy on youtube thank you so much for joining us and uh experimenting with us a little bit it seems like things worked out this time so yeah we'll be doing some more of these yeah we'll co-stream today i think i've got uh pz myers tomorrow to talk about or the origin of life and carol christian and i will be around on thursday with our astro coffee hangout so i want to thank you all so much for watching and as always keep looking up <laughs>